finish off the last of the presentations uh, and then we're going to continue with um, with graphs to models and we will do things we will go over them again and then we will go over them again and it might seem repetitious but if we don't do that then a uh, very short time from now you will forget uh, and if we, if we go over it a couple of times three four five seven times I guess you'll remember at about the seventh time um, some people quicker than that, but so we will t go through and push on and then go through and push on. Um, a couple of things though, if you're not understanding something, please ask. Um, getting a couple weeks behind in something and then coming saying I have really never understood um, since about two weeks ago. Um, it's really a good idea to not get two weeks behind. Um, if you don't know what a word means, ask, please, because um, sometimes uh, I use examples of things that aren't common uh, common knowledge. So please ask and if you get ask again. Uh, there are stupid questions, but it's even okay to ask those ones. So uh, yeah, go ahead. So that's what we're going to do. We're pounding through. We're going to start doing something as he's getting ready called testing the assumptions of our statistics of the models that we are using. This is something that typically we don't do until graduate school, uh, and typically people don't do it until their fourth or fifth stat class in graduate school, which means about a third of the to half of the papers out there use stats that don't meet the assumptions for what they're supposed to, which is why uh, the estimates are somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the papers published out there aren't reproducible. Um, when other people try to do them. It's not because the people have any intent, it's just simply because we pound forward. Go ahead, open up. Okay. And I'll shut up so you can go. But that um, we don't test our assumptions and we're going to do that as we move through um, <coughs> so we know what the weaknesses and what we're doing are. Are good? Go ahead. Hi, uh, my Connor, and my Rex uh, creature was the Calancentius Cepidus, or the blue crab. Um, so, trying to compare something that's a few inches and a few ounces to something that's uh, several feet and several tons is kind of wonky. So, I just used the uh, like agreed upon uh, dimensions for the T Rex and the agreed upon average dimensions for the blue crab. I got a height length approximation, average them out. Assume that the T Rex length would be constant use it, and use it as a multiplier, and got that for my adjusted uh, lengths. I did something very similar with the weight. Uh, you can see right there. That's how I got um, how much I figured my uh, giant monster's blue crab would be. Um, in addition to this, the, the blue crab also has uh, two claws a striker and a crusher. Uh, since we're going to be having this in a relatively giant glass aquarium, we needed to figure out um, how, how much newtons are behind its striking power. <coughs> so, um, you know, large the crab, large the striking power, do similar approximations, got uh, 7, uh, 759 newtons in the striking force. Um, their bottom feeders, so they eat when they want to eat, uh, they eat their young, they're cannibalistic, they just find whatever they want to find. So, that's the approximation I use. Uh, uh, XKCD did an article for a comic on how, about how many calories a T Rex would need to eat per day to maintain its uh, weight, um, applied it to my situation. And they eat things like chum, dead vegetation, uh, their eggs when they find them, and uh, mostly the cheapest option would be chum. Uh, their breeding, lifespan, and mortality rate, um, they're fully mature between 12 and 18 months. Um, there's no record of anyone living longer than three years, so dead blue crabs can be used as uh, food for the giant ones just to keep going. Um, average clutch is around 1,000 eggs with a 13, uh, sorry, 38% survival rate, so you know, mostly eaten by uh, predators, primarily blue crab. They are truly horrible creatures. Uh, this is my little tank, uh, tank markup. Um, the material we use, um, which it would provide the uh, bare minimum surface, uh, bare minimum protection from them, and the uh, 
cheapest would be a uh, ballistic glass with a thickness of 1.65 uh, inches. Uh, cost right there, uh, $10,800,000. Tank requirements, um, it would require a temperature between 58, uh, 55 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, pH balance between uh, 6 or 8, anything from outside that range is considered lethal. Um, salinity is important and, and can change um, from 3 to 15 parts per thousand. Um, those are my citations. Did you want to bring up my costs on the spreadsheet too? Or? No, just bring up your model if you want. Absolutely. But do turn in your cost sheet. <coughs> Here's my model here. Um, I was playing around with it, so that's why the survival A rate is 0.45 instead of 0.38. Um, starting clutch was 1,000. Uh, death rate, I got that to around, uh, I was place I was playing around with, it's actually like 0 0.0001. Uh, there it is right there, since they're mostly their own predators, because they are horrible beasts, they need to introduce uh, the other predator. They don't bond off to uh, mate, they just you know, lay eggs and leave them. Any questions? Anything else? Uh, I would I would check on the one point six five inch list of glass of being able to hold the water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, just suggesting an aquarium of that size should have six to eight inch thick ballistic glass. Alright, sounds good. Cool. <laughs> Alright, that's a good reason. Pardon? Do you still need Google? Uh Maybe. All right, so we're going to play a little bit with the same data set that we've been using so we don't have to switch uh, data sets. And it's going to be the halibut fixed data set again. And so we're going to do our library R commander. Go to data and load data set. And somewhere in my downloads, I should have halibut fix. Not sure where you have it. All right. And this should have uh, the data in it that we need. These are the pretty creatures that we will we were talking about when we were talking about sablefish. Slow growing sort of bottom feeder type. Alright. Um, let's see if we can find a fishing escape. Find a picture of that. going to get skate fishing. <laughs> Which is not quite the same thing. All right. There you go. That's what a fishing skate is. A piece of line with a hook on it and a kilometer long. Okay. Lots and lots and lots and lots of hooks. You reel them in and stuff comes in. All right. So let's get back to our our commander here. Uh, we were testing last time and people were told we were doing copious captions and then the models that go with them. So we are going to work our way through a couple of models again. Uh, the first one we're and talk about the assumptions of the model. So let's go ahead and load our, uh, how many do you have a coin? When you come up to your R commander plugins, how many of you have coin? When you bring it up, do you have our commander.coin? We tried to load it earlier. Anybody not have it? Pardon? Who does not, anybody not have it? 
Okay, so everybody has coins, so let's go ahead and control click on coin in KMGG plot. And we'll have to restart the commander and say yes. And reactivate our data set for Halibut Fix. <coughs> We have it. People have the data set up. Still hunting, searching, fishing. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, yours is. <laughs> All right. While it's coming up, I wanted to bring up a few things about the com the, the commonest misuse of Kruskal Wallace is to accept significant results as indicating the difference between means and medians, even when the distributions are wildly different. Such results would it only be interpreted. The, but let's start with the most common misuse and then go down to 2,000 differences in mean values. We're analyzing using the man Newton test for U and the Kruskal Walsh for comparisons to three to do the difference in medians. Most common misuse is to do the comparison. Anyway, we're going to do that because <laughs> it's fun. And I like evilly misusing statistics. So let's go to KMGG plot. We're going to do a box plot. We are going to do our, do we have, do I still have my skates less than? Ooh, I have to create my skate less than two again because I didn't save mine. You probably have your skate less than two, right? No. No, we didn't save that. All right, so let's see if we can. Let's see if we can just do this one from memory. We're going to do halibut fix. Dollar sign. This is how we put a variable in. And the F has to be capitalized, right? I'll, and I'll make a mistake here. We'll fix it. All right, so halibut fix, dollar sign, uh, skate, LT5, oops. And we're gonna, I use that as the assignment operator because then I don't confuse it with equals, which can be used the same way, but I use it differently. You can use equal if you want. All right, so we have, uh, we have uh, uh, less than minus, and uh, I'm gonna paste that over, and it's gonna be another dollar sign, but I forgot what the name of the variable was. I'm going to view the data set, and it's called EFF skate set. EFF skate set. All right. Less than five <coughs> times one. Okay. Sure, why not? <laughs> it might not in fact work, but then at least we'll all have the same mistake. <laughs>
Did anybody <laughs> run it? Does it work? All right, I'm, I'm going to be brave here. <laughs> and I'm going to click submit. And did it give me an error? What did it say? Nothing. Okay, so I'm going to select this thing and see what it gives me here. Error checking. Numeric zero, how is it fix? Did I this type something there? <coughs> ah, I have too many dollar signs here. There we go. Now it should work. I'll zoom in. Yeah, let, let me run this here to just show you how that would be done. And should, there we go. Give me a bunch of zeros. Hopefully there are some ones. There are. Life is good. Zoomer. Okay. So what did you get? So? Uh, there was the dollar. I had the dollar dollar sign skate LT5. I had dollar sign skate LT5 dollar sign effect of skates, which means I was trying to put a variable inside of a variable and inject it. Thank you. 
All right. All right, now we're going to turn that into a factor. Watch the error number, guys, and if the error number doesn't go up, it's it's good. So we're going to now go to, yes? Pardon? I typed the right uh, formula, but it doesn't work. OK, have you got to view data set? Yeah. And slid over to see if it's in your data set. Okay, is it over at the end of the data set? In skate? I'll come up and have a look, but. I have it. What? I have it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. You have skate less than five. It worked. Oh, okay. Right. It still leaves the old error messages sitting there in front of you, unless you remember the number. Keep doing it because it's the same. Yeah, it should. It updates the number, and you have to go look if the number stays the same. Is there? No, I think we got it. Anybody else? Well, good. All right. So now we're going to turn that into a, a factor, a numeric uh, from a numeric variable to a factor. So go to data. Manage variables in active data set, and we're going to convert numeric variable to factor. Okay. <coughs> Can you do that again? <laughs> uh, go to data, active data set, and refresh it first. Refresh active data set. And then we're going to go to data, manage variables, convert numeric variable to factor. Data, manage variables. Convert numeric variable. here and we're going to supply the level names and we're going to leave the variable the same. So we're going to go down and select skate LT5, make it active, leave it at supply level names. Thank you. Thank you. Issues? Is your, is your hand up or your? Yeah, I didn't have the uh, Did you refresh your data set? No, I did that. Okay. And then, okay, I'm going to overwrite it, and zero is going to be skate GT5, and one is going to be skate LT5. Okay. Did it show up after you refreshed? <laughs> it's there? Yeah. All right.
So now we should be able to go to KMGG plot. We're going to run a box plot. It's going to be skate less than five. And over here it's going to be sable fish. And we're not going to hit anything else. KMGG plot, box plot, skate less than five, and sable fish. say OK. And we get this graph, which some of you produced as your graph for your copious captions. All right. So does it look like more sable fish are caught on skates greater than five? Yeah. OK. Certainly, certainly looks like it to me. Um, and then here we have the Lowest point, the 25th percentile, and the median are all the same. And then this is the 75th percentile, and then the upper whisker and a bunch of outliers. Okay. And you know we have those same values here. Are our medians different? No. All right. And then so we're going to go use the Kreskel Wallace as a test of the difference of medians. So let's go to stats and non-parametrics, and we will do the Kruskal-Wallis test. And we will do skate less than five and sables, sable fish. And OK. Yes, is it statistically significant? Yes. Are the medians statistically different? No. All right. The distributions are different. But a Kruskal test is only a test of the medians if the distributions are symmetric about the median. Then it's a test of medians. And there aren't very many ties. So those are the assumptions. So this one tells us that there's a difference in the distributions, but if we said there was a difference in the medians, we would be completely wrong. But then somebody's going to say, you idiot, you're supposed to use the Man Whitney U test, which conveniently is called the Wilcox test in R. So we're going to run the Wilcox test because everybody knows it's a better test of the difference of medians, which we know is zero. And it gave exactly the same p-value, which in the case of two groups, that happens with the Kruskal-Wallis and the Wilcox test. So um, anyway. <laughs> I make fun of that because people get sort of caught up in, in that they heard this was the better test or something when they are probabilistically identical. All right? So we can use either the Wilcox, and I, all I did was change where it said, um, I just put Wilcox.test here instead of Kruskal.test and left everything else the same. I just changed Kruskal to Wilcox and I ran it. And I got a huge W score on that versus the Kruskal Wallace chi square. But um, at this level, you're going to get your, your results aren't going to be there. Same problem with the man with the U. 
is the assumptions are also the same as a two factor across the walls, right? That would be symmetric around the medians. And is this symmetric around the medians? No, because how do we know? Because these boxes and these whiskers would have to be the same length on both sides for it to be symmetric. Does that make sense? So it doesn't really fit the assumptions uh, of the of the model. But what's the other measure of central tendency that we like to use? The median is one. The mode, that's another one we like, the most common. What's the mode here? Zero. All right, so we'll switch to the third one because um, we don't really have difference of mode tests, multinomials, but we're not going to do it. Um, so we're going to go to KMGG plot. And we're going to select our 95% confidence in it using the T distribution, using skate less than 5, and Sablefish. Okay, and we'll leave everything else the same. Oop, I sure hit the wrong one there, didn't I? Skate less than 5 and Sablefish. Yeah, we just added 95% confidence interval um, okay. from box flat. All right. And so that's going to give us that interval that will contain the true mean if this was a random <coughs> sample of a normal variant. Okay. If this was a random sample of a normal, normally distributed variable, then that would be the true mean would fall in there 95% of the time. Okay. All right. So we're going to say, OK. Now we've got these nice big um, air bar, our confidence intervals. But, and do they overlap? No. Uh, do the, do the mean of, is the mean of either one in there? Uh, the mean of this one inside the confidence interval is that one? No. And is the mean of this one inside the confidence interval is that one? No. No. They're really far apart. So the chances are it's going to be really significant. And we like that. So we're, we test that going to statistics, fit models, oh, I like means, and independent samples t-test. We're going to go to fit models in a minute. Skates less than five, and sable fish. Right, so we got 16.02 or 208 and 16.02 or 8.02, and those are our differences. That's what we see right here. Those are our means. It gave us our means, and our p value is that there is a two and a quadrillion, two and ten quadrillion, two and a very small number. Two in a really, really small number. Two, actually, two in a really, really, really large number. Um, so it's not. So this is something that's uh, statistically significant. Okay. Is it meaningfully different? Is eight more fish per skate meaningfully different? It depends. Yeah, it depends on if, if, if there is a trillion sable fish out there, right? Probably, yeah, it's statistically significant. Is it managerially meaningful? Probably not. But in this case, they're rare, slow growing fish. So, and you're not supposed to catch any of them. And if you were being fined $1,000 a fish, would this be meaningful as a boat operator? It would suddenly be very meaningful as a boat operator. 
right? And the $25,000 of treasure is going to be really, really meaningful. All right, so, um, so yeah, that's pretty important. That's uh, a pretty important managerial difference as well as a statistical one, all right? Um, but those are supposed to be, and, and we're using the Welch's two tam sample where we don't assume the variances are equal. But let's go, just ask that question, are they equal? So let's go to statistics and variances and Bartlett's test, we can use any of them, it doesn't really matter. But I'm going to do Bartlett's because I like it. And then we're going to do Sablefish. And OK. And we do, again, we don't know what k squared means unless we're a grad student in SAC and stats. So we go to our p-value. We know big means more significant. We go to our p-value. And again, it's really, really close to zero, which means we reject Bartlett's. Bartlett's significant means we reject equal variances. Unequal variance test was the correct choice here, um, and it gave us a massively significant p value. Okay. So our assumption, uh, we used the unequal variance, and our assumption of unequal was not violated. So. The t-test is fairly robust here, and we can be happy with that, um, except the um, except the mi minor minor problem of all of those zeros. <coughs> so bear with me a minute. We're going to jump to the next set of models that you want to do on this. What kind of a variable is this? What kind of variable is Sable? Continuous, discrete, categorical. Well, you, there might be half a Sable by the time you get it up, but you count whole Sable. So the number seven means You pulled it in, and the number seven means there were. Yeah, and that's what kind of variable? If you have, you can do it on your pinkies. It's a count variable, okay? It's, right, so it's. of a test do we do for a count variable? Well, it's in the, it's in Moodle, but what type of model for count variable? So we see, we see a word that comes up several times. It should be a segue. It's French for what we're looking at here. So 
sorry. Right? Sorry. It's, it's a bad pun for a segue, but yeah. It's a Poisson model. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, that's really bad, I know. What to do? Isn't there a Little Mermaid song that has that in it? No, anyway. Uh, anyway, anyway, it's a statistical movie. Um, so we're going to go to statistics and fit models and generalized linear models. It's the first time we've done this. We're going to use the generalized um, linear models here. And we will go down in our output variable here that we're going to do is our sable fish. That's the output and skates less than five is our input variable that we're going to test with our Poisson, which I pronounced poorly I'm sure. Yes, thank you. How, you. how should it be pronounced? Uh, Poisson. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, and we're going to say do we have it? Do you want me to go back through how to get there? I'll do that one more time. Statistics, fit models, generalized model. And we're going to put sable fish in the left hand side and skate less than five in the right hand side. We're going to leave everything else alone, except we're going to double click, click on Poisson and it's going to go to log, which is double click, sorry, yeah. Double click on Yeah, so um, so do we have it? All right. And we're going to say okay. <laughs> right. Um, and oh my goodness, there's some estimates and some numbers. Skate it's, uh, less than five is less than seven, less than that. Two. Is it really significant? Yeah, that's a really small number, right? Two e to the minus sixteen. It's got the three stars. The three stars is really significant. When we come down and we look up here. Don't worry about the rest of this for right now. It's super significant in the Poisson too. So I would go back and use the t-test because people will understand it. Um, yes? Um, so I looked for log. It says log in the You got to double click on the Poisson. Okay. All right. So. This for Dr. Bonacorsi's lab, we would do, be doing negative binomial, but that's for later in the semester. Um, but Poisson is a standard thing to test, right? If you get the same result with the Swanky model that you got with the simpler model, present the simpler model in the paper and the Swanky model in your footnotes. Okay? If you're in genomics or have to present Swanky models for, for, to prove your Swankiness, you present the Swanky model and put the simpler model in the footnotes. All right, but general, in general audiences, but we can go, let's go ahead and go to models and graphs and effects plots. Okay, and yes, and we can put plot parcel residuals and I would normally do that, but with this many observations, I don't think it will work. With this many observations, I think it'll tank. And it will say, yeah, there's, it, it's, there's too few. So. This gives us our, again, our 8.02, and so our means are the same, <coughs> but our error bars are really small. Okay. <laughs> Did you not get that? Yeah, can you do that again? Oh, sure. I went to models, oh. graphs, 
effect plot, and I click my, the partial residuals, but there's too many data points going to puke on me, so it doesn't really matter. So I just click yes and OK. And I now get my error bars, except <coughs> these error bars are associated, these are 95% confidence intervals associated with a Poisson distribution, which is appropriate for counts. And the best work on this uh, stuff is by two brothers named Legendre, but they write in French, so forget it. Uh, for, except for those of you who <laughs> might possibly read it in French. But uh, yeah, I was in a lab with them for a while, didn't understand anything they said. Um, they really are. I mean, they would help us study it, right? Um, all right, so we understand that because we assumed normal, we ended up with much bigger error bars in the t test one than we do with the Poisson, which is the correct ones, or more correct. Okay? So, uh, again, I would present the t-test ones. Does that make sense? So, we have, um, and, I, and it, because the effect sizes are so huge here, there's such a big difference in the number caught. And there's so many fish that, I mean, so many observations that we can, you know, pretty much any test we do is going to show these differences. But sometimes there are only slight differences, like in all of Dr. Grant's work. Um, it's true, right? They're always right at the edge of 0.05. If you manipulate the variable a little bit, it's 0.049 versus 0.057. Um, and I don't mean to be mean, but when you, when you do multivariate work, it can be sketchy. Um, so a Poisson might give you a very different result. So that's why I bring this up. And we will go back through this, all right? Are we clear on what we've done? Okay, so we, we were looking for, asking the question, was there a difference if we reduce skate sets allowed in terms of the number of sablefish count? Okay, and the answer is, yeah, so we have a policy tool here, because just asking if things are significant uh, in the world of conservation is nifty. Um, but, but if we want to change things, it should give us a relevant policy. So we looked at a difference in medians. There was no difference in the medians. But the test told us it was significant, which means that there's a difference in the distributions. But then we moved to asking if there was a difference in the means. And we used the t-test to see if there was a significant difference in the means. We then used a Bartlett's test to ask if the variances about those two groups, about those two means, was different and said it was. Then we turned our thinking caps on and said, well, this is a count variable, so maybe we should use a count model. And so we went and ran a count model, which is called a Poisson, and it lives in the generalized linear models world, which is under fit models and generalized linear models. There's lots of models over here, okay? And there's one other one that we're going to do because it creates really goofy results. But we're going to take. No. You might need them tomorrow. <laughs> I'll say that again tomorrow. Um, all right. So, does that make sense what we've done here? Is we've walked through the basic way in which we do analysis. We graphed it. We did a simple test looking at medians. We did a simple test looking at means. Then we did a more complicated test looking at. The, the variables. We looked for the assumptions. We didn't look to see if there was symmetry around the means. And we, could, we could do that. We will eventually. Um, and then we ran a Poisson model, which was the appropriate one, or is an appropriate one, for count data. All right, we're going to take about a five minute break, and then we're going to come back uh, and we'll do, uh, we'll do zero, one models. All right? And in there, there is, uh, it says COE, there's a missing D. I uh, should say code for Sable, but it says code for Sable. Um, please go to that and grab all the lines in there, not the last modified, but all the lines of code in there, and copy that and paste it into your R Commander script window and run it. 
and that will give us one more variable that we want to work with. You're just selecting from the H till the last parentheses. go to data, active data set, refresh your active data set, and then view the data. And way out at the end there should be something that says some stable, no stable. Okay? And close it. Be all the way out at the end of the data set. Did. did you refresh your data? Yeah. And did you cut? Did, did it give you an error when you ran it? That's an error. Everybody got it. So now let's go to a KG, KMGG plot. And we are going to do a box plot. And we are going to do any sable and depth. So <coughs> is depth of, depth of fishing a predictor of sable caught? <coughs> Okay. And we're, we're just going to say, okay, this is the wrong way to do the analysis, but we're going to do it anyway. Because um, this is, right, because the machine will let us do it and therefore it must be okay. All right, so, so in this one we have, we have, it, it looks like it, right, the deeper you are, the more stable you catch, right? Uh, and um, so we have y and x. So this is a little bit wrong because uh, 
Sable can't cause death unless they're really good diggers. Right, so sable aren't causing depth. We want depth over there, but if we do depth as the x and sable as the y, let's go ahead and do that. 